Good evening and thank you for joining us. A snowy winter and equally snowy spring has had a significant impact on Thunder Bay's finances. $1.4 million in budget overages is being predicted for the city's road division to tackle the many snowstorms. Last night's city council meeting also saw Mayor Bill Morrow speak about the potential cost of the administrator who's been appointed to oversee the police board. Corey Nordstrom reports. Countless snowstorms did more than annoy Thunder Bay locals this year. They're costing the city a large amount of money. A $1.4 million deficit is projected for the roads division. Those funds will need to come from the Winter Control Reserve Fund, which currently totals just $1.8 million. So the Winter Control budget is approximately $7 million in 2022, and about 90% of that has already been spent to date. Uh, the... Um, the forecast that has been provided uh, through the roads department is that uh, to the end of December, which means right through for so another uh, few months of winter uh, work that would be need to, uh, need to be done would result in a 1.4 million unfavorable variance to the end of the year. That deficit was offset by 1.5 million in additional revenue related to COVID-19 reopenings. The city's projecting an overall unfavorable variance of $900,000. Higher fuel costs are expected to add $400,000 to the budget. Thunder Bay police are forecasting a half million dollar budget overrun and rising legal fees are expected to cost the police board an extra $200,000. And then they're going to have another additional 0.2 million like this is this is very significant. There were also questions around the council table if they would have to foot the bill for Administrator Malcolm Mercer coming in to take control of the police board. Mayor Bill Morrow says when the last administrator was brought in, he requested the OCPC pay his salary. It was going to be our cost after my discussion with them. It was not. So uh, we relieved ourselves of that cost. The discussion on this one, I almost had it with the gentleman the other day, but I will be having it with him next week. And with the city looking to cut the tax rate for commercial businesses to move closer to the provincial threshold, taxes are going up for residential homeowners. City Council voted to implement option one of this table, seeing a reduction of costs for commercial taxpayers. Because the commercial class is such a large class, it is second uh, to residential, any change in that ratio does have a significant impact on the other property classes, specifically residential. So that's the focus right now to bring that down to the provincial threshold so that it can fully um, share in, in the levy increase. And council got some good news from t Tell as the utility was able to provide a $21.9 million dividend to the city coffers. Corey Nordstrom, TBT News. The province broke the big news on Friday that Thunder Bay will host the 2024 Ontario Winter Games. And today, local officials hosted a celebration event to provide more details about the winning bid. This will be the first time the Winter Games have come to the city since 1974. And organizers plan to showcase Thunder Bay as a premier destination for these types of events. Vasilios Bellos has more. The event is set to kick off in February 2024 and will feature athletes aged 12 to 18 competing in up to 27 events. This includes cross-country and alpine skiing, speed skating, artistic swimming, and more. The theme for Thunder Bay's bid was Return to the North, which featured a video from prominent local athletes. Paul Burke is the chair of the bid committee and talks about the devoted work that went into making this happen. Well, the bid process included a letter of intent that was due, it included a 209-page bid document that needed to be submitted, and then there was a, a site visit and a presentation that the bid committee made to the, the review team. The Ontario government has committed $1.4 million of funding for the Games, including $400,000 to cover travel expenses for the expected 3,500 participants. This extra funding will eliminate any barriers for those hoping to attend and no doubt result in an even larger economic boost for Thunder Bay. We're talking about eight hotels just for the athletes and coaches and managers. We're talking about 27 sport venues. So this is a really large event and uh, we're hoping that, uh, that athletes and their parents all come and make a real Northern Ontario experience out of the event. 
With the recent Scotty's Tournament of Hearts a clear success for Thunder Bay, many including Mayor Bill Morrow are confident the 2024 Ontario Winter Games will be another way the city can prove themselves as an exceptional host for large sporting events. It'll be the 50 year mark since they were last here and the city without a doubt will step up to the plate and do a spectacular job of hosting these athletes, their families and their coaches. Uh, no doubt about that at all. The opening and closing ceremonies are set to take place here at Fort William Gardens, though there is still some significant work to be done. This includes establishing a games organizing committee, securing venues and finding over 700 volunteers, all to ensure the event is a huge success for Thunder Bay. Vasilio Spellos, TVT News. The provincial election is just over five weeks away and the Ontario Liberals appear to have some nomination issues. As of right now, none of the four ridings in the Northwest have a confirmed Liberal candidate. With Michael Gravel announcing yesterday that he's stepping down in Thunder Bay Superior North due to, the, due to health issues, the party now has to find a replacement in that riding. Ontario Liberal leader Stephen Del Duca says the four vacancies in this region will be filled soon. TBT News has learned that city resident Rob Barrett is seeking the Liberal nomination in Thunder Bay, Atacokan. The social work consultant is currently being vetted by the party. But there's still no word on any Liberal candidates in Superior North, Kenora Rainy River or Kiwitanung. But Del Duca insists he's confident that candidates will be in place in time. The Ontario Liberal Party has nominated more candidates than the NDP and that we are fast approaching the number of candidates nominated by the Conservatives. So this is just my way of saying we will continue to work hard. There will be some news coming out just a little bit later this week, so stay tuned. Um, but we're going to make sure we have a full roster of qualified women and men running in all 124 ridings as the campaign gets underway. Meanwhile, the Ontario Green Party has named its four candidates in the Northwest. Local anti-poverty advocate Tracy McKinnon is running in Thunder Bay Superior North. Atacokan High School teacher Eric Arner is the Green candidate in Thunder Bay Atacokan. Red Lake Suzette Foster is the party nominee in Kiwitanung. And Northwestern Health Unit staffer Catherine Keevening from Dryden is running in Kenora Rainy River. Meanwhile, the two Ontario opposition parties are launching verbal volleys at the Ford government. The election call is now a week away and the Liberals and NDP are putting the focus on home care and health care. Siobhan Morris has the details. I can't have it. I can't have it. A stroke during a heart surgery when Jaina Ray's mom, Gail, was just 67 changed everything. It actually ended up being a really um, challenging time trying to figure out what was the best course of action. With new complications and her mother's mobility limited, Ray struggled to make heads or tails of the options. Gail spent her time in long-term care before her family took her in. With the election on the horizon, Ray hopes all politicians will hold a few things close to their hearts. To allow people to live uh, for as long as they possibly can with the greatest amount of independence and the greatest amount of autonomy when it comes to decision making about their care. The progressive conservatives say on their watch, nearly 32,000 new long-term care beds are in the works, with more than 26,000 being upgraded. We have made a commitment to long-term care, a commitment that is, uh, yes, it's about building uh, brand new modern uh, facilities, but it's also about transparency and accountability, and it's about improving staffing and care. The PCs have given personal support workers a permanent $3 an hour raise. Both the NDP and Liberals say they'd tack on another toonie. If the new Democrats manage to unseat the PCs, leader Andrea Horvath says she'll hire 10,000 PSWs and phase out for-profit long-term care. We're going to work hard with current operators to put together uh, transition plans when they are uh, the for-profit providers. And we're going to make sure that long-term care and home care are funded at a level that actually provides the four hours of hands-on care and long-term care that people deserve. <laughs> but with no defined finish line. Ontario Liberals will end for-profit long-term care with a target date of 2028. Stephen Del Duca is promising a focus on care at home, earmarking billions more dollars for the sector. That will mean that 400,000 more seniors in this province can access a community-based home care system that is easy to navigate. A similar pledge by the PCs is projected to help 700,000 families. And that was CTV's Siobhan Morris. 
COVID-19 hospitalizations have fallen for the third straight day at the Regional Health Sciences Centre. There are now 22 patients in hospital, down from 26 on Monday, and there are still three people with the virus in intensive care. That number is unchanged. The hospital's occupancy rate is now 104.6%, and the ICU is nearly 82% full. For the fourth straight week, vaccine numbers are up across the Thunder Bay District. Nearly 2,900 shots were administered last week, up from 2,400 the week before. According to the Ministry of Health, nearly 86% of people, five and up, have gotten at least two doses. More than 57% of those 12 and up have received at least three shots, and nearly 15% of seniors, 60 and older, have had four doses. Meanwhile, the health unit is reporting another COVID-19 outbreak today at the Quay Kiwin Centre run by the Shelter House. The Special Investigations Unit has terminated its probe into the actions of the OPP in Greenstone after officers used a spike belt to stop a 30-year-old driver last month. The spike belt caused the man's vehicle to lose control and roll over. The driver was sent to hospital with what was believed to be a shoulder injury but turned out to be a small air pocket between his lungs and bruising in his abdomen. The injuries, though, were not deemed serious and therefore it fell outside of the SIU's mandate. A time capsule that lay inside the walls of the Finnish Labour Temple for more than a hundred years was opened today for the first time. The capsule was recovered during the demolition of the building following the devastating fire in December. And the contents have now been donated to the Finnish Historical Society of Thunder Bay. Lee Noonan was there. The capsule contained the text of the speech given during the 1909 cornerstone ceremony, the minutes of the meeting where the Finnish socialist local voted to build the Labour Temple, a copy of a Finnish-American newspaper and two very rare copies, one on paper and one on silk, of the Tuakansa, a Finnish newspaper published in Port Arthur. No other complete copies of the historic paper are known to exist. Your Mahalanen, vice chair of the Thunder Bay Finnish Canadian Historical Society, opened the capsule. He will be working with society president Saku Pinta to translate the speech which focused on anti-militarism and the socialist project to overthrow capitalism. A lot of the blue-collar workers tended to be quite intellectual. Moses Hall, like I said, the guy who wrote the speech, had only grade 8 education. But he had read philosophy, he had read economics of the time, he had read even... Um, Darwin on evolution, obviously, since he wrote a primer on evolution. He had, th these guys thought about big ideas. The artifacts will be preserved at Lakehead University, where, once the restoration is complete, they will be publicly accessible. University archivist Sarah Janes was on hand to ensure proper handling of the 113-year-old documents. Yeah, the documents do seem to be in good condition. We have material that's both paper and we have uh, documents that are printed on silk. And they are a little bit damp, they have a little bit of surface damage, but they're still very readable and will be very usable and understandable for people. Janes expects that the water damage to the documents is largely attributable to the firefighting efforts. The Finnish bookstore and Brad McKinnon, the developer who acquired the landmark building before it was lost to the fire, are using the occasion to launch a fundraising initiative, selling books and bricks from the Labour Temple to offset costs for the new condo project that will occupy the site. Our, our goal with the, the brick and the book fundraiser is to raise $100,000 to be put towards um, rebuilding the historic facade of the Finnish Labour Temple, most notably the... Uh, uh, the tower, the cupola, the side towers. The bricks are reclaimed from the original facade and printed with the dates of its construction and of the fire. Local historian and author Kathy Toivonen has been commissioned to produce a coffee table book that will also be sold as part of the fundraiser. She's looking to collect stories and photos from the Labour Temple's more recent history. When we think about the Finnish Labour Temple, it's... Uh, been home to comedy festivals and uh, the Hoito was uh, featured in You've Got to Eat Here. Um, so there's a lot of things that have happened contemporary in modern times that we'd like to bring to the forefront. Anyone who'd like to share their stories of the historic building is encouraged to come down to the Finnish bookstore, bring your photos, write down some memories, or just get more info on the project. Lee Noonan, TVT News.
An impressive achievement for a Thunder Bay High School student who is one of just 35 from across Canada chosen as a 2022 Loran Scholar. St. Pat's grade 12 student Georgia Campbell was selected from a field of more than 5,100 applicants. Campbell will receive a $100,000 scholarship over the course of a three-year post-secondary program. It was an extensive selection process with multiple interviews, but Campbell stood out because of her clear devotion to improving her school and community. She served as a member of student council, founded a STEM empowerment group at St. Pat's, and co-directed a program to deliver holiday cards to long-term care homes. I'm just in shock still <laughs> and I think it will just continue I'll just continue to be so grateful for the opportunity and happy or I guess like proud of myself too for putting myself out there and just like going with it. And for her impressive list of accomplishments Campbell has already been accepted to Queen's University and the University of Toronto for programs related to engineering, life science and biochemistry. It's been nearly three years since the last major Pride Month events were held in Thunder Bay, but this year they're returning in a big way. The Rainbow Collective of Thunder Bay and the Thunder Pride Association have partnered to host the 2022 event. This year's Pride Month will see a wide range of activities put on by the two organizations, including a flag raising at City Hall on June 10th and a Pride launch party at Goodson Co. Market. There will not be a Pride Parade this year, but organizers are bringing back the popular Pride Street Festival, now in the Waterfront District on June 17th. This year's theme is Reunite. Thunder Pride Chair Valentino Donoso and Rainbow Collective President Jason Veltri say that couldn't be more fitting with the two organizations coming together. It's been a tough two years for all of us, and uh, there's a lot of lateral violence in our community. Um, so. This is, this is a start of, I hope, a really fruitful relationship with you know, our, our sister organization in, in our community. Especially considering Pride Month is something really big and considering all the events we have, maybe just working separately, it didn't make sense. So obviously, uh, like, we, we needed to do this. Pride Month officially kicks off on June 1st. The first events consist of a drumming circle and a pre-Pride party on June 4th. Well, can't wait for that. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, Mitch, I would imagine...